my favorite equation in life is one plus one equals three. And in, in the case of, of media, to me, offline plus digital is that one plus one. Okay, welcome back to the Marketing Playbook presented by Details Interactive. Here you'll take away three game-winning marketing plays every episode to take back to your team. I'm your host, Mark Friedman, and my career has been focused on direct-to-consumer marketing, direct mail, physical retail, and digital commerce. This is episode number 57, and today's guest is Alan Kraft. Alan has been a longtime friend, fellow Mets fan, long-suffering, or should I say forever-suffering, Jets fan. And he's currently the chief revenue officer of a business that he co-founded called Media Horizons. Alan will describe what they're doing to help their clients acquire new customers. And as you'll hear, how that customer acquisition landscape changes each year. Before we get started, a quick thank you as always to Max Brandstetter of the Wild Business Growth Podcast for producing this episode. You can reach him at max at maxpodcasting.com to help bring your podcast to life. Let's open the playbook. Ready? break. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Marketing Playbook Podcast. This is episode number 57, and today I'm joined by Alan Kraft. Alan founded Media Horizons in 1988 with the express goal of building an agency whose core values are steeped in serving its clients' needs and in nurturing its staff's professional development. Over the years, he has led the company's strategic expansion from its beginnings as an insert media company to its current state of being a full-service, digital and offline response marketing agency. He currently directs the company's new business efforts, oversees thought leadership positioning and content development, and partners with the broader senior management team on the company's ongoing innovation initiatives. Alan, welcome to the show. Well, thanks so much, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, you know, you and I have uh, been industry friends and, and, and I'll call you a friend uh, for a very long time. So I really appreciate you uh, making the time uh, to talk with uh, us today. I think you've got a uh, really interesting story that uh, our listeners uh, will, will really like to hear. Um, I mentioned to you, you know, the listeners, um, it, it's kind of an interesting range. It's uh, because I do a lot of mentoring of, of early stage businesses. You know, we have a number of people who are just getting their start in their career and learning how to work and develop uh, uh, business skills. And then we've got people that are from our generation that uh, have learned all that we probably are going to learn in our careers. So uh, welcome to the show. One, one interesting tidbit that I, uh, you had mentioned to me a while back, you've been to nine Super Bowls. Is that Correct. true? It is true. So we were very, very fortunate for those nine years uh, to be guests of a, of a media partner of ours who would literally bring 300 clients to the Super Bowl every year, would take over a hotel, would have tickets to all of the NFL events, the, the, the party the night before the game, the, the tailgate prior to the game, game tickets itself. Um, and, and it was extraordinary. The only problem is, uh, as I think I've shared with you over the years, I'm a uh, downtrodden New York Jets fan and I've never gotten to see my team in person. So, um, you know, hope springs eternal. Maybe this will be the, uh, be the year, but, uh, but yeah, nine Super Bowls, um, some, some amazing memories. And I'll just share with you and your listeners that in my humble opinion, New Orleans should be the permanent home of the Super Bowl because it's the only city in America where you can walk to this stadium from every hotel, restaurant and bar and not have to deal with uh, buses and, and, and public transit and all of that stuff. So, uh, I've been to three there, Absolutely my favorites. Um, you know, just great experiences. Well, I can't throw stones because um, my, my team, which is the Giants, haven't been there in a while. And I think the last statistic that I saw over the last five years, the two worst teams in, in all of football are the Giants and the, and the Jets. So obviously the Meadowlands MetLife Stadium is cursed. You and, I, you and I have just so much to be proud of. Yes, but we're Met, we're Met fans, right? And, and the Mets are playing well. So let's not jinx that. Exactly. 
Okay. So, we you know, we usually start these shows uh, getting what we like to call the, the guest's first story, kind of, you know, a little bit about where they grew up. Maybe, uh, as I hear oftentimes, especially for entrepreneurs, um, you know, was there something in their family life that, you know, gave some perspective that they might also be entrepreneurs? So what's the Alan Craft first story? Yeah, thanks for asking. So like you, I grew up in Brooklyn. Um, you know, can't imagine uh, having grown up in a better place than that. I actually lived in a in a very blue collar, very working class neighborhood in, in Flatbush. Um, 30 um, attached brick houses on one side of the street, 30 attached brick houses on the other side of the street. Every house had two and a half kids. Um, we literally had enough kids within a five-year age span that we not only had our own softball team, but we had our own softball league. It was a great experience. Um, but you know what? Growing up in that sort of working class environment, everyone um, from the earliest ages really kind of hustled for a buck. And uh, I probably started working you know, as a paper boy at age 11 or 12 delivering groceries for the little grocery store around the corner, or delivering uh, prescriptions for the pharmacy around the corner. And it was, it was really all, always about, you know, is there a way for us to, uh, to make some money? Because honestly, none of our parents really had, a, a, you know, a lot of discretionary income to, to give to us. So, so I, I like to think that I kind of honed my entrepreneurial skills when I was in my, my early teens and um, and that sort of set me on the course for uh, entrepreneurship later in uh, later in life. Yeah. So maybe tell us about that first opportunity to be an entrepreneur. It was during school. Uh, explain what that was all about. I was hired by a a list brokerage company called Dependable Lists in 1976. Uh, one of the owners of the company happened to be an extra neighbor uh, of ours in, in Brooklyn. You know, he uh, saw something in me, I guess, that that uh, gave him some thought to, you know, maybe, maybe this guy can be a, a good direct mail guy. Um, and, and, and keep in mind, in, in the mid to late 70s, the, the, the direct marketing business was kind of run by the by the list companies. There were five or six iconic list companies, Dependable being one of them, the Clyde Company and Coolidge and Woodruff Stevens and, you know, Direct Media and a few others. And it was just an incredible experience uh, because we were working with with you know dozens and dozens of of catalog companies and and direct marketing companies you know currently you know thought of as direct to consumer marketers right uh, back then direct marketing was was sort of the the nomenclature and and I just I, I learned so much and I worked with some amazing people and, and worked on some amazing accounts one of which is still a, a client of ours today. So, so one of the very first clients I worked on in 1976 was the Danbury Mint uh, collectibles company. Uh, and they're still a Media Horizons client today, um, all these years later, which I think is pretty cool. It's 46 years. Wow. And so that was your early start. And then kind of, you know, you've obviously been involved or you started Media Horizons. When did you start Media Horizons? So I started in 88. So I actually worked between 76 and, and 88. I worked for three really passionate entrepreneurs, um, two in the list business. One was a company called Supermarket Communications. I don't know if you remember, Mark, there used to be those take one displays in the in the uh, alcove of supermarkets. I'm much younger than you, Alan. So I, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, you're not that much younger than me, Mark. <laughs> uh, maybe you just didn't do the grocery shopping. So, so I, I work for these three really passionate entrepreneurs who love their businesses. They all had very, very different styles. I, I learned a tremendous amount from all three of them, but, but I knew all along in, in watching them and watching the enjoyment that they got from running their own companies, that that was something I wanted to be able to do for myself. And, and in uh, the spring of 1988, I was very, very fortunate. Uh, two gentlemen, um, uh, Ed Cabico, who's no longer with us, and, and Lou Pepe, who ran a company called Media People, uh, where my wife worked before our older son was born. They approached me and said that uh, they would love to start a, a direct marketing agency and would I be interested in running it? And so um, I had an opportunity to start the company. I had uh, funding, although I will tell you, looking back, uh, nobody had invented the term bootstrap yet. Uh, but if you look in the dictionary, there might be a picture of me sitting in the basement of an old house. It was truly a bootstrap kind of endeavor. 
Um, but, you know, we, we, we sort of got it going. I, I was also fortunate in that uh, one of my clients, the Wall Street Journal, uh, we had a, a great relationship and, and uh, he moved his business over to Media Horizons the day that I started the company and we were kind of off and running. That's awesome. That's, that's a great story. So talk about Media Horizons from the perspective of, you know, today, the core competencies. And, you know, I, I like to, to think that, you know, all agencies, any business for that matter, that is consumer focused, you know, is trying to solve a problem for their clients. What are the problems that, you know, people come to you with that you're helping them solve? So, so I guess the elevator pitch is, is what we're best at is customer acquisition. We've always been, you know, very, very good at, at understanding, you know, how to acquire customers, how to manage to uh, an acceptable cost per new customer, how to help generate customers that were going to have maximum lifetime value. Obviously, quite a bit has changed since 1988 in terms of the media mix. Um, I would say just a, a little bit has changed. So we started, we were purely an offline agency because that's all there was. Uh, we did a lot of insert media back in the day. We did a lot of direct mail. And we did a lot of on-page advertising in, in magazines and newspapers. I'm very pleased to uh, report that we still do all of those things and that rumors of the demise of offline media have been greatly exaggerated. That said, we uh, started to build out our digital practice uh, about 15 years ago. Or so, and we've staffed that with a number of, of I'll refer to as absolutely brilliant, you know, strategists, uh, both generalists and, and specialists. Uh, a lot of time spent for our clients in, in paid social and paid search, connected TV, display, and, and so on, but not at the expense of the offline. The offline is still very vibrant, very, very viable for our clients and, and um, you know, still produces really strong results. And when you think about, you know, this, this offline to online, you know, obviously it's, it, it, as you uh, related, it, it's changed quite a lot, but it, it almost feels like there's been this pendulum swing. You know, it went from, you know, paper, um, everybody figuring out or trying to figure out how to aggressively move away from paper and move to digital, but it's seemingly come back more to the middle over these last few years. Is, is that what you're seeing? It, it, no question about it. Of course, this year has been a little bit of, a, of an aberration in terms of paper. As you may know, there's been a, a, a real paper shortage uh, along with the supply chain uh, issues this year, but, but there's no question about it. I think, I think a number of our clients are digital native companies who simply capped out on, the, on their growth. They, they just couldn't grow anymore, and, and clearly Facebook is not performing as it had been previously. It's uh, no secret there but um but the offline media continues to be um extremely powerful and and you know you you may hear me say several times during the course of our conversation that my favorite equation in life is one plus one equals three and in, in the case of, of media to me offline plus digital is that one plus one equals three it's really understanding the mix right and 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 you know, the one thing I will say is that that I, I think one of the things that we're best at as an agency is that no two clients' media mixes look quite the same. You know, it, 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 there's no uh, cookie cutter approach to it. There are, are some for whom offline media, you know, leads the way, uh, particularly in the senior market, which I think is pretty, you know, logical, right? Um, and then you think about some of the, the uh, you know, the clients that we work with who are targeting Gen Y and Gen Z and millennials for whom digital tends to lead the way with direct mail in particular, you know, from the offline side, very, very much in support of that. So uh, no, no, no two mixes look the same, but, um, but I think that's really where the, uh, where the skill lies is trying to identify what the right mix is on a client by client basis. So if I'm a digitally native business and to your, use your words, capped out, and I think you, we've seen a lot of those businesses start, they get to $50 million and, or whatever the number is. Um, and they realize, geez, you know, we've, we've, we either don't know how to get to the next level or they simply can't. And they come to you, what kinds of vehicles from a direct mail or a offline perspective are available to them? So, so clearly direct mail, you know, tends to be the, the channel that is most easily explained to them because they're seeing so much of it in their own mailboxes. Um, the other uh, element of direct mail that I think 
resonates well with the, the CMO at a digital native uh, company is that we can conduct a matchback at the end of the campaign. Talk um, about that. Talk about that a little bit more detail. What is a matchback? So essentially, it is a, a process under which the, the file of names that's been mailed gets matched to all of the transactions that take place over a given period of time stemming from the in-home date of the direct mail to typically, you know, three, three matchbacks of, of six weeks, eight weeks, and 12 weeks post-campaign. And we're able to provide solid attribution as to, you know, whether or not the, uh, the mail campaign actually worked for them or not. Right. And so this is with the intention of seeing, you know, they put a, a piece in the mail, could be direct mail piece, could be catalog to see if uh, those catalog names were now predisposed either through because of the catalog or, or whatever uh, to now shop online. Correct. Correct. And, 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 you know, I think that that makes direct mail a little bit easier for these digital natives to understand things like on page print. And, and insert media that are less, you know, for the most part attributable or, or, or uh, the measurement capabilities are a little bit less specific than direct mail or a little bit more uh, difficult for them to wrap their heads around until they see the success that their competitors are having. So as an example, there's no shortage of, of digital native wine companies in the US, all of whom are using insert media uh, you know, to to mass degrees, hundreds of millions of inserts a year being used. So, so there it's sort of the old fashioned, um, I'm going to do what my competitor does kind of an evaluation. Um, same thing is true in the meal kit category. So Hello Fresh, you know, Blue Apron, Freshly, Sun Basket, they all see what the other ones are doing. Um, insert media happens to be one of those things that they all do, uh, you know, to a great extent. And, um, and so if it's working for them. It's going to work for me. I want to be there. You talked about customer acquisition, um, you know, as kind of your uh, secret sauce or your core competency uh, of the business. What are you seeing in just in marketing in general right now? You know, we're recording this in, in May of 2022. Uh, you know, we've got inflation, you know, pretty much running rampant, uh, unfortunately. Uh, what are you seeing in the media space with respect to costs? So I think that we are, you know, we're seeing increased costs, certainly in, um, in offline media uh, as a direct result of production costs going up. So paper and, and, and printing um, postage has gone up, as you know, and will continue to go up in, in the digital space. Um, I think we've seen similar increases. Uh, I think it's just forced us on behalf of our clients to be that much sharper in how we negotiate on their behalf um, and, and how we, we truly target the optimal media mix for each of them. One of the things that I've seen in, in businesses that either I've run or that I've consulted for, you know, you talk about media mix, you talk about attribution, you know, none of these things are exact sciences. So how, you know, when you, you come, I'm sure you've got a, a broad range of knowledge uh, within your customer base, you, you come bring the subject matter experts. How do you help your clients understand what the attribution is beyond the matchback, right? Because it's not all about matchback, especially if you're, you know, got a, a customer that is using a lot of different digital channels, but how are you showing them what that attribution looks like and how they should be changing the dials of the media mix? Yeah, it's a great question. So, so people ask me all the time, you know, having been in business uh, for 34 years, what's changed the most? And they, they always seem to um, uh, prejudge that my answer is going to be, well, digital is the biggest change. In, in, in reality, while that's been a, a massive change, right? Um, the biggest change for us is the investment that we've made in our data and analytics team and our data and analytics resources. Um, and to the degree that they really sort of lead the way in terms of, of our planning and forecasting on behalf of clients, they are uh, at the forefront of all media plans We get created. Nothing goes out the door until it's been vetted by the data and analytics team. They really have a hand in, in the, the, the media and marketing decisioning that a generation ago would have, wouldn't have even crossed our minds to include those folks in the discussion. So, so I think it's really been a, um, you know, uh, 
just a, a massive change in, in approach and attitude to, to how we build out uh, customer acquisition plans for our clients in that you know heavy reliance on our data and analytics team. Those folks are on pretty much every client status call. Um, they're reporting out the results to the clients. The clients have come to expect to hear it from what they view as being this impartial set of of eyes and ears who are really studying the data and, and able to really respond to, to the nuances of, uh, of what's happening in their businesses. Do you find that, and I'm probably going to ask you to generalize or a stereotype, and maybe that's not fair, you know, the businesses that you, you have worked with that have tended to be direct mail focused, do they tend to have a bias towards keeping books and pieces in the mail at the expense of being more aggressive in digital? Well, you know, the old saying is old habits die hard, right? I think for some, um, that would be the case. For others, I think I think what they ultimately want to be able to do is report back to their leadership that we've been able to hit and surpass our goals as a company, our growth goals, um, and, and that whatever it takes, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the media mix rarely, if ever, looks the same across, you know, two clients or 10 clients or whatever. You know, I, I think some of those biases or some of those sort of traditions from sort of the more old line marketers have kind of evaporated. And I think now, you know, in part due to the evangelizing that we've done to the digital natives for things like offline media, I think those biases uh, are going away as well. I think people are understanding that that they need a healthy mix, that they can't rely on a single source. Facebook is great, but it's not the only thing out there. Uh, direct mail is great, but it's not the only thing out there. So you really need to have um, you really need to have experts in your corner helping you figure out what that mix should be. One of the things that I hear often from uh, folks that have you know kind of grown up in direct mail and, and using that as their their main source of acquiring customers and retaining customers is that they feel like they can't acquire customers with the same lifetime value digitally as they were able to do through the use of paper. Uh, do you still fight that battle? We we do. It's interesting. So um, we did just have a conversation last week with uh, with one of the wine companies about some direct mail results. Was this before or they after they opened the bottle? <laughs> you know, uh, it was a video call. I don't seem to recall anybody um, anybody drinking. But you know, you never know what's in somebody's swell bottle, right? Uh, <laughs> I I will simply. Uh, I, Great. Mark's holding up a swell bottle. <laughs> spring. So, so um, in this particular case, we actually heard really probably for the first time that I can remember them saying, you know, the, the uh, LTV from uh, direct mail was not as good as the LTV was from our digital channels. And, and we questioned it and, and we're continuing to question it. And there's been some shifts in their, uh, their, their marketing team, and, and we're not sure whether or not we're really getting the, the full picture or not. But I'll, I'll hold to the, the old you know, adage that, that you know, LTV from direct mail in particular and offline channels in general tends to be better than from digital channels or from television, as another example. Do you have a direct-to-consumer business? I enjoy connecting with guests on this podcast because it reminds me what I love to do, strategic and tactical consulting for businesses like yours. If you'd like to speak with me about your business and see how you can add a fresh set of eyes to your team, contact me at mark at detailsinteractive.com. Now let's get back to the marketing playbook. You know, you've been a, a business owner uh, for quite some time now. What kind of challenges do you as a business owner um, and we'll talk about the the uh, acquisition or the sale of your company uh, not long ago. But you know, at, at when you were a standalone business, what kind of challenges did you face most often? I mean, the, the the biggest challenge is always being able to turn it off, right? When it when it's your business, you know, there there's really no off uh, off ramp. Uh, it was twenty four seven for you know three decades or more. You know, other challenges, you know, we're based in, in Fairfield County, Connecticut, which is a lovely place to, to live, but a horrible place to commute. And so some of the challenges we've had over the years, I think, that are unique to our business is that, you know, commuting times uh, when people were coming to the office regularly were routinely an hour, hour and a half, two hours in, in some cases. And, you know, we get employees who would 
pretty well burn out, uh, you know, from that. So retention was, was always a challenge from that perspective. But I think, I think the, the, probably the, the biggest challenge we faced early on was, was understanding exactly what it is, you know, we wanted to be, you know, here we were, we were this insert media company, and then we had a client ask about direct mail. So we became this direct mail company. And then we had another client ask about print. We became a print advertising company. It was really trying to figure out that what we were going to be was this customer acquisition focused agency and then building it out so that we had the right folks who were client facing and then all of the right internal resource groups that can manage, you know, the, the day-to-day business for those clients. Yeah. Interesting. The, uh, the, what you want to be when you grow up. Um, I'm still asking myself that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's hard. And, and, you know, one of the things I've always, you know, looked at, it, at, at agencies like yours is, you know, can you be a one, you know, a, a one-stop shop for businesses like the ones that I've run and our listeners are running or part of? You know, can you be the subject matter experts in all of the things that you your clients need you to be? Um, and I guess you can, but do you have a point of view? I do. So, so um, I think it's fair to say that. Similar to how no two clients have the similar media mix, no two clients really uh, interact with us as their agency in, in quite the same way. There, there are clients for whom we're their sole agency. We manage all aspects of their acquisitions from creative, you know, right through media planning and strategy and, and data analytics on the back end. And there are others who choose to use us for very specific media channels. Um, I've got a digital agency. I want you guys to handle my direct mail for me, or I've got a, a direct mail agency, I want you guys to do our paid search for us. So, so there's a real mix there as well. To answer your earlier question though, uh, you know, I think the, it is difficult, you know, when you have got a sort of a broad mix of clients, B to C, B to B, targeting the senior audience, targeting the, the, the millennials and Gen Zs, it, it, it can be difficult to, to lay claim anyway, to that we could be all things to all people kind of a, an attitude. And, 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 you know, we, we tell people all the time, we learn on the job right along with you. Sometimes I'll, I'll tell you a quick story, you know, in, in the 34 years that we've been in business, our, our biggest customer engagement, which lasted 21 years was for a company called Orec vacuums. And you may remember the ads carrying, uh, you know, uh, David Orec as the spokesperson and, you know, when I first met David in, in uh, the fall of 1989, uh, we were introduced by a mutual friend over a nice dinner in, in Manhattan. And he said to me, what do you know about selling vacuum cleaners? I said, I don't know anything about selling vacuum cleaners. I've never sold one in my, uh, in my entire life, but I know a lot how to, uh, about how to acquire customers. And he goes, I appreciate your honesty. You're hired. And we went on to 21 years of, of massive success. Together, we helped you know him and his organization grow, uh, you know, geometrically over years. But we didn't know the first thing about selling vacuum cleaners, nor did it really matter to us. It was it was a product. There was a, an audience that that needed the product or wanted the product, and let's figure out how to best take advantage of that and, and put the two together. Yeah, you were, we were talking where you were a- answering my question about agencies and and being all things to all people. You know, it, it always reminds me in these kinds of conversations two cliches. One is, you know, you sometimes you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, but on the other hand, I like having one throat to choke. So it it depends, I guess, you know, on who the agency is. Not not the first time you having been a client. Not the first time I, I've heard you say that throat to choke part. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, it, it's funny. I heard that. I don't know. I was at Steve Madden and we were doing a, a tech project. It was a replatform. And, you know, we had some decisions to make about, you know, who was going to help us get the work done. And, you know, one of the tech people said, geez, you know, we need one throat to choke here. And I just, you know, it just resonated with me. And I'm like, yeah, you know, you need to be able to, you know, be void of people pointing at, you know, fingers at the other players. Um, you need to know who's in charge and, and who's going to take ownership and responsibility. So your uh, company was sold not long ago. Tell us about that. We were acquired in January of 2020, right before the start of, uh, of the pandemic. Um, we were acquired by a company that very few people have heard of um, called Central National Goddessman. 
It's a fifth generation family business. I've been around since 1886. It's actually a $7 billion privately held company that, um, that sells nearly 8 million tons of paper packaging, pulp, tissues, and metals annually. Lots of people in the, in the direct-to-consumer world or catalog world would be familiar with one of the brands, which is called Linden Meyer Central, probably the largest supplier of paper to catalogers and magazine publishers. And we had first met them you know, through one of their folks um, in the summer of 2018 or so. And we started doing some agency work for some of their paper customers and you know, grew some nice relationships together and it was going along very nicely. And, and they, they had the idea that, that if it's working you know, as cousins, it would work better as brothers. Um, and so we started some serious conversations with them around the third quarter of, uh, of 2019. You know, we weren't looking to sell the company at that point, um, but we're really excited about the fact that, A, this was a, a $7 billion company that still behaved like an entrepreneurial organization. Um, B, they've got a, a fabulous list of, of customers, many of whom have now become agency clients of ours. So there was a great synergy there. We got to meet a number of their sales reps around the country, um, some of whom we knew from, from uh, other engagements of theirs and ours. And it came together really nicely. Even the, even the process itself, um, it's funny because in the very first meeting, um, I uttered that uh, equation that I mentioned earlier, uh, one plus one equals three. In that case, meaning, you know, Lyndon Meyer plus Media Horizons, you know, the, the sum would be greater than the, the parts. And the uh, CFO and general counsel of Central National um, actually termed our project, our acquisition project, Project 113. So we knew that these were the right folks. Um, there was never a question in our mind that, that um, it was going to be the, the right set of relationships. And, um, and it's proven itself to be just that over these you know, nearly two and a half years now. That's, that's interesting. And as, a, as the founder of the business that's now stayed on, and presumably, you know, you, we all have, no matter what level we're at, we have somebody to report to. Uh, presumably, you have somebody that you're reporting to. Was that a difficult uh, change for you? Well, you know, on some levels, to be perfectly honest, sure. Um, but but the, the person to whom I do report now, because I, I have a boss for the first time and in over 30 years. Is, I think your wife would dispute that though. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a given. Uh, <laughs> I think the, the uh, he's, he's a terrific guy. We, we get together regularly and, and we talk strategy and, and we talk about business opportunity and, and he's open-minded and, and um, you know, he's, he himself had sold his company to Central National a number of years earlier. So, so throughout the, the actual sale process, he was a great advocate you know, for us as, uh, you know, he was acting as, as the buyer, but he had been through the process as, as seller. So it, it took a little bit of getting used to, but, um, but it's great. And, and I got to, I got to tell you, you know, being part of a, of a $7 billion company that that's, you know, nearly 3000 employee employees around the world is pretty sweet. It's, it's a nice place to be. Um, it's, it's created some great new opportunities for the folks who work for us. Um, and we've learned a heck of a lot about the paper business that we didn't know before. <laughs> you know, just one thing to come back on, you know, where we are and, in, in, you know, the last couple of years, what, what would you say now looking back to, you know, early part of 20, just before the pandemic, seeing your clients, what they were probably doing, hunkering down when the pandemic first started to take shape in, in March and April and in May of 2020. And now, you know, seeing things change yet again, what, what, what stands out uh, in your mind? So, I mean, so much, um, you know, this has just been, I, I think, you know, not just unprecedented as you'll agree for, for all of us, but really trial by fire. I mean, you think about it within this, this, what is it now? 26 month time frame, right? From March of 20 through, through in May now, as you said, you know, we've dealt with people staying home from the office. We've dealt with people staying home from distribution centers. Um, so, so many of our clients who are, are, you know, direct to consumer marketers were challenged early on in staffing their, their fulfillment 
centers and getting the product out to to the consumers um, simply because of of COVID and COVID protocols and and so on. And and then of late, in the last I don't know nine twelve months or so, we've we've been dealing with all of the supply chain issues and the paper shortages. So it's it's really been I think you know, in, in my now rather lengthy career, totally unprecedented. I, I can't ever remember a time. I and mean, we've been through stock market downturns. We've been through, through you know, all sorts of, of you know, cataclysmic uh, events in our world. But I don't think we've ever gone through anything quite as prolonged as this that keeps sort of um, morphing, right? It, it, every time you think it's all set, you better and, and all that, you, you know, there, there's something else that seems to be a, a curveball. But I think for the most part, um, what's been most satisfying about it is that is that everybody has adapted well. Um, you know, you and I are doing this conversation over video today. You know, we didn't really do much Zoom or, or Teams or Google Meet before COVID. And, and now all of a sudden it's become second nature to us all. Um, I'm just now over the last, I don't know, six, eight weeks or so getting out to see clients in person again. And, and that was always a big thing uh, for us as a company. We, we always believed in the importance of sitting in a room with our clients, brainstorming, and if there were problems, solving those problems and identifying new opportunities and, and you know, videos, video. And, and, and as you know, the, you know, at, at 2.58 p.m., somebody's going to go, got to go, got another call. But when you're sitting in a conference room together, people have a, a you know a tendency to stay and let's keep working on this, you know. So lots and lots of challenges. But I think, I think you know, for the most part, uh, we've been able to overcome those. And uh, we're looking forward to a, a few years of normalcy. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, well, we're coming down to the end of, uh, of our show. Uh, great job, Alan. But we can't let you go without... Uh, going through our two-minute drill. You ready? Seven questions, one or two-word answers. Uh, okay? One or two-word answers is not my thing, Mark. I know, but that's why I... <laughs> it's funny. I, I say that in every episode, okay? Every interview that I do, and almost never do the, does the guest stick to one or two words. So let's see if Alan Kraft can be the one. All right, here we go. A brand that you admire or that inspires you? Uh, Gold Belly. I absolutely, absolutely love um, what they've done. I, I, I'm sorry, I told you. <laughs> but what I love more than anything else is they made it possible for a number of restaurants to stay in business throughout the pandemic. Yeah, I agree. The favorite app on your phone? I'm a total weather geek, uh, weatherchannel.com. Last website other than Amazon that you shopped from? Uh, Brochu Walker. Uh, Mother's Day gift for the aforementioned uh, wife. Okay. I hope she liked it. She did. Something that you're not good at, but that you wish that you were? Uh, asking others for help. Okay. So you're not the guy that's asking for directions when you're lost. No. And, and, and listen, <laughs> I started my career driving all over the country with, with, a, with a Rand McNally road atlas. Uh, so you're probably not even using Waze. Uh, I do use Waze. Come okay. On. A charitable organization that you're passionate about? Filling in the Blanks, which is a local uh, organization here in Connecticut that helps to feed school children that otherwise might not get uh, healthy and, and uh, hearty meals. If you had one superpower, what would it be? Uh, this is a tough one. Um, would love to go back in time and have the, the health and fitness uh, of me as a 20 year old, but with the wisdom and experience of me as a 60 blank old. <laughs> <laughs> and other than family, what's your most prized possession? Well, I gave away all my Mets and Jets memorabilia to my kids. So I, I, I guess it would be my Civil War book collection. Okay. Where can people uh, reach out to you uh, if they want to find you on social media, Alan? Uh, LinkedIn. Okay, great. Uh, thanks very much for uh, being a guest today. I, th I think you gave a lot of great insights. Uh, it's been uh, very nice to be your friend uh, for so many years. And uh, I hope we have uh, many more years being friends. I agree. Thank you so much for having me. And, and uh, this was fun. I had a great time. That's it. Today's game ball goes to Alan Kraft for coming on the Marketing Playbook. To me, today's three game-winning marketing plays were as follows. Number one, Media Horizons has been around for over 30 years, and with each passing year, they've had to evolve based on market conditions and the needs of their customers. 
They've demonstrated the ability to be flexible and learn the tactics that their customers needed them to have as part of their toolkit. Use that lesson to continue to evolve your own skills. Number two, we all need to learn how to turn off business or our job. Alan described one of the challenges of being a business owner as always feeling like you're working. With so many methods of contact for all of our jobs, forcing yourself to disconnect is critical. For those that know me, I'm guilty as charged. And number three, each brand's media mix is different. Your businesses might require more paid social or more search or more direct mail than others. Do not feel trapped by what you're doing today. Push yourselves to test new marketing channels and be certain that you have tools in place to be able to fully understand which of the tactics you're using is bringing you your desired goals. Thank you, Playbook Marketers, for listening to another episode. If you want to check out more pages of the Marketing Playbook, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast spot and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also follow us on Twitter at Details Interact and learn more at detailsinteractive.com. Until next time, the devil is in the details. Yeah.